Uh, only two or three months ago, I had lunch with a reporter from Time magazine, and he took me out to, to, to lunch in Manhattan, and he said, Mr. Irving, you know, before I came out for this luncheon engagement with you, he's writing a book and he wanted to pick my brains, he said, I went through our archives, just to see what there is in our clippings archives in Time magazine on you, and one thing that struck me is until you published your book, Hitler's War, in 1977, you came up roses, you couldn't put a foot wrong. And then ever since 1977, you've had buckets of slime poured on you. <laughs> and I'm the same author. It's, I write the same books. I do the same kind of research. But the trouble is that they don't want to read the books that I write anymore. My publisher in London, Macmillan's, wonderful publishers, full of courage, until I wrote the book about Winston Churchill. And then suddenly they... they they became very shifty, very nervous, and Harold Macmillan said this book would be... Uh, unfortunately, I can only show you my beautiful leather-bound uh, edition. That's the only one I've got left with me now, because uh, I sold all the others out. Um, but Harold Macmillan said this book would be published over my dead body. So I waited until he died. <laughs> and, uh, this was one of the basic problems that... Uh, Churchill had in, in the war years, persuading the Americans to come in and fight his war for him. Because by 1940, it had become Churchill's war. It was no longer concerned with Poland. Poland was forgotten as soon as Poland was defeated. The, the war by 1940 had become a matter of self-prolongation. It had become important for Churchill's own political reign that the war continue. Churchill's great nightmare throughout 1941 was that he was going to find himself blundering into war with Japan alone and that the United States would hang out until the last minute and then not come in. This is written very large in all of Churchill's deliberations, both inside his cabinet and in private. Not, of course, that Churchill's deliberations inside his cabinet mean very much, because Churchill's cabinet had about as much brains as the band in the Johnny Carson show. <laughs> you see, Churchill knew that Roosevelt wanted war, but Churchill was familiar with Roosevelt's basic problem, namely that the American people did not want war. Churchill did all he could to help Roosevelt out of this dilemma. We were reading the German submarine codes. We knew where the German submarines were in the Atlantic, so Churchill took pains to ensure that our convoys coming across the Atlantic, escorted by American ships, would head directly for where the German U-boats were, in the hope that the U-boats would sink an American ship. This was the kind of thing that we can see going on now that we're gradually getting access to all the files. You now begin to understand what the British national interest is, that these things should not be released. Back in 1938, Churchill's biggest problem was the ambassador, Ambassador Joseph P. Kennedy, the American ambassador in uh, the court of St. James. Joseph P. Kennedy, one of my favorite characters of World War II, the father of President Kennedy, who was probably not one of my favorite characters. Joseph Kennedy was a glorious... Irish Catholic bigot. Roosevelt had a sense of humor in appointing him to, to London and he admitted that he'd done, only done it as a bit of a joke. <laughs> Churchill found it anything but a joke when he became Prime Minister. Kennedy had a habit of reporting back to Washington the truth. When Kennedy went to ask Chamberlain, the Prime Minister, why he wouldn't have Churchill in his cabinet, Kennedy's reply was, the man is very unstable and he's become a fine two-fisted drinker. Churchill knew what Kennedy was reporting because we were reading the American diplomatic codes as well. And Churchill did everything he could to get rid of Kennedy, by fair means or foul. In fact, Kennedy, as his diaries make plain, we've got certain fragments of Kennedy's diaries which are quite interesting because he was viciously anti-Semitic. The Kennedy family won't release the diaries, but certain fragments have become known. They're held in the Kennedy archives in, in, uh, in Boston. Kennedy believed that Churchill was capable of stooping to anything to bring the United States in. In one telegram, he reports back to Washington that he thinks that Churchill is on the point of bombing the U.S. Embassy in London. <laughs> a hundred yards or so away from where I live, and he believed that Churchill, in 1940, was about to bomb the American Embassy in London in all, and, and claimed that the Americans had done it. And then later on in 1940, when Kennedy decides to go back to, to, to Florida for a vacation, he takes the plane down to Lisbon and he boards the USS Manhattan to sail back across the Atlantic. And in a bit of a panic, because you know who he's dealing with, he's dealing with Churchill, he sends a telegram to the State Department saying, please will you announce that if the USS Manhattan is torpedoed and sunk, it will not be considered a casus belli. 
that the United States will not declare war over this because I have reason to believe that Churchill is planning to torpedo the USS Manhattan, <laughs> knowing that I am on board. Now, these telegrams are not contained in the published volumes of the Foreign Relations of the United States. I found them in the archives. They're in Suitland, Maryland, and I've quoted them in, 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 in this volume on Churchill. And I quote even more hilarious telegrams in the subsequent volume, in volume two. But they do show that Kennedy had correctly assessed what Churchill was up to. He was trying to drag in, uh, to drag in the United States into the war by hook or by crook. Churchill finally hit on the idea in the middle of 1940 of buying from the United States 50 destroyers, World War I destroyers, which were completely useless, and exchanging them, in fact, for valuable pieces of British Empire real estate. He gave to the United States bits of the Caribbean islands that were our colonies. He gave bits of Newfoundland and bits of British Guiana in return for 50 destroyers that were so useless, in fact, that not one saw action in World War II except, I think, for the Campbell Town, which was only fit to be towed across the English Channel, laden with dynamite and blown up in the French dock gates in Saint-Nazaire in March 1942. It wasn't a very good bargain, in other words. Uh, some, uh, not some of the world's, Adolf Burley, the American uh, Undersecretary of State, wrote in his diary, with one single gulp we have managed to obtain a large part of the British Empire in return for nothing, namely these 50 destroyers. This was one of the methods that Churchill was using in an attempt to drag the United States closer and closer to the brink of war. Another method that he used was far more cynical. As he said to Ambassador Kennedy in June or July 1942, you watch, when, uh, 1940 rather, at, 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 at the time of the fall of France, Churchill said to Kennedy, you watch when Adolf Hitler begins bombing London and bombing towns in Britain like Boston and Lincoln, towns with their counterparts in the United States, you Americans will have to come in, won't you? You can't just stand side aside and watch us suffering. But he knew from code breaking, he knew from reading the German Air Force signals, which we had broken on March, on May the 26th, 1940, that Hitler had given orders that no British town was to be bombed. London was completely embargoed. The German Air Force was allowed to bomb ports and harbors and dockyards, but not towns as such. And Churchill was greatly aggrieved by this, and he wondered how much longer Hitler could avoid carrying on war like this. But Hitler, as we know, carried on until September 1940 without bombing any English towns. The embargo stayed in force. You can see it in the German archives now, and we know from the code breaking of the German signals that Churchill was reading Hitler's orders to the German Air Force not on any account to bomb these towns. So there was no way that we could drag in the Americans that way unless we could provoke Hitler to do it. Which is why on August the 25th, 1940, Churchill gave the order to the British Air Force to go and bomb Berlin. Although the chief of the bomber command and the chief of staff of the British Air Force warned him that if we bomb Berlin, Hitler may very well lift the embargo on bombing British towns. And Churchill just twinkled. Because it was what he wanted, of course. At 9.15 that morning, he telephoned personally bomber command himself to order the bombing of Berlin, a hundred bombers to go and bomb Berlin. And they went out and bombed Berlin that night and Hitler still didn't move. And Hitler ordered another raid on Berlin and so it went on for the next seven or ten days until finally on September the 4th, Hitler lost his patience and made that famous speech in the Sport Palace in Berlin in which he said, this madman has bombed Berlin now seven times. If he bombs Berlin once more, then I shall not only just attack their towns, I shall wipe them out. A very famous speech. Of course, German school children are now told about the Hitler speech. They're not told about what went first. They're not told how Churchill sent out deliberately to provoke the bombing of his own capital. And on the following day, Churchill ordered Berlin bombed again. Sir William Stevenson, remember the man called Intrepid, the head of the British Secret Service in, in the United States? Sir William Stevenson had been feeding fake documents to Roosevelt through the intelligence service of the OSS. William Donovan, big bill... Wild Bill Donovan, the head of the OSS, a man who we ourselves had appointed as the head of the American Secret Service. An, an extraordinary coincidence, you might think. And we were feeding documents to him to feed onto Roosevelt, proving that Hitler was about to invade South America. <laughs> For example, an unfortunate Major Elias Belmonte, who was the Bolivian military attaché in Berlin, found his signature at the foot of a letter that he'd written to his government in La Paz, 
describing German plans to invade Bolivia. <laughs> Unfortunately, Belmonte was recalled immediately to La Paz and cashiered and dismissed. Uh, uh, Bolivia declared war on Germany. All the result of this letter that we ourselves had faked, the British Secret Service. All this came out a few years ago when it came out in about 1972. Uh, Belmonte, who was still alive, was reinstated in full honors, promoted to general, and there was a grand parade in his honor in La Paz. This was <laughs> one of the extraordinary episodes of what happened in World War II. A British intelligence agent duped the governor of Dutch Guiana into believing that a German raider was busy in their waters. So that uh, country also declared war on, on Germany. August the 2nd, 1941, we passed fake documents to the Bogota claiming uh, evidence of uh, 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 plans to cause riots in Bogota. In fact, in 1942, the, the Colombians didn't play along. In 1942, we went a stage further. In May 1942, if you look in the State Department files, just, I mean, this but is rather shaky post-war memory 40 years later speaking on 60 Minutes. This is a document in the State Department archives. May 1942, the American ambassador in Bogota sends a rather worried telegram to the State Department saying, I've been approached by our British counterpart, saying that the head of their uh, SIS section, the British Secret Intelligence Service section, attached to the embassy in Bogota, STAG, S-T-A-G-G, -G, has received orders from his headquarters to assassinate the Colombian foreign minister. Uh, are we, and has he requested the American embassy for technical assistance in carrying out this mission? Are we to go ahead with this? And the State Department wrote back um, a message saying, no, you are not to go ahead with this. We thoroughly disapprove of this kind of operation, and we are getting rather fed up with what the British Secret Service is getting up to down in South America. And I was a bit puzzled about this. I thought, had this unfortunate Colombian foreign minister, had he got a record of neo-Nazi activities, perhaps? Was he a disbeliever in the Holocaust or something? Which... <laughs> Was there some, some reason that justified his being terminated, I think that's the modern phrase, by the British Secret Service. So I went to great trouble and I checked all the diplomatic books and I, went, I checked up all the stags and eventually I found a stag, a Lewis stag in fact, who had been uh, honorary consul in a kind of Graham Greenish fashion down in Cuba, in Havana, and then eventually had been posted further to South America. And he was alive and well and living in Paris. And I went and interviewed him and yes, it was true. He had been instructed to assassinate Lopez de Mesa, was the name of the unfortunate Colombian foreign minister. And I contacted the Colombian authorities. Could they give me a small cameo of this foreign minister? Was he particularly pro-German? Pro, pro oh no, he was very pro-British. Plot thickens. Why would we want to assassinate a pro-British Colombian foreign minister in May 1942? Answer is, he was due to retire anyway at the end of that month. <laughs> And the blame was going to be put on the Germans for carrying out the assassination. This is all in volume two. Needless to say, Macmillan's are probably not going to publish what, this one either. <laughs> on Navy Day, October the 27th, 1941, Roosevelt issued a statement on American ship sinkings. History has recorded who fired the first shot, he said. Hitler has often protested that his plans for conquest do not extend across the Atlantic Ocean. His submarines and raiders prove otherwise. So, so, dies the entire, so does the entire design of his new world order. For example, says Roosevelt in his broadcast, October the 27th, Navy Day, for example, I have in my possession a secret map made in Germany by Hitler's government, by the planners of the new world order, printed by Her Majesty's stationery office in London. <laughs> It is, it is a map of South America and a part of Central America as Hitler proposes to organize it. Today in this little area there are 14 separate countries. The geographical experts of Berlin, however, have ruthlessly obliterated all existing boundary lines and have divided South America into five vassal states, bringing the whole continent under their domination. This map makes clear the Nazi design not only against South America, but against the United States itself. I must say that as an Englishman, we must take credit for this kind of thing. We, we, we printed that map and we gave it to Stevenson, the man called Intrepid, who gave it to Donovan, who gave it to the OSS, who gave it to the White House, who gave it to the President, who gave it eventually to the Roosevelt Archives, where it is now to be seen in the Roosevelt Library in Hyde Park in New York. The genuine fake Nazi map proving that Hitler <laughs> was planning to invade, I mean, as though Hitler hadn't got enough on his plate, for Christ's sake. 
I mean, here he is. Here he is having a lot of trouble outside Moscow, and he's apparently planning simultaneously with his left hand to, in, to, in, to invade South America and then march on up, up, up uh, US-1 to Washington. Schmidt has said that only Hitler would benefit if a US-Japanese war broke out. If Japan made the first move, the war would be popular in America. Frankfurter, however, said, Germany has been smart in that she has consistently done everything possible to, arouse, uh, to prevent arousing the United States. Therefore, regardless of how much the president tries to fan the anti-German flame, he cannot make the desired headway. Now, what a scandalous statement that is. Here's the one country, Germany, trying to prevent a war. The other country, Roosevelt, neutral, trying to fan the flame of anti-German feeling in order to create a war. And yet it's the Germans who are called the criminals and the Americans who do the prosecuting. <laughs>